Memory management, DMA, and interrupts are three advanced topics most modern programmers never get involved with. Today, we have operating systems to manage all that mess, and the only interruptions to deal with are management and end users. So, let's look at how people in the ancient times of the 1980s used to write complex code, without the modern comforts of an operating system getting in the way of the hardware. This is an introduction to these topics, There'll be more in-depth videos later, so hit subscribe to get notified when they come out. We're all about how hardware works on this channel. I don't just collect the machines to own them. I want to experience programming them as well, see what that's like. In this video, let's take an overview of three concepts to see how they work and what they could be used for. This is all based on various models of ZX Spectrum and the Spectrum Next, but the general concepts are pretty much universal. So what we'll look at are the following. Memory management. How an 8-bit CPU can use large amounts of RAM. Interrupts, because while the concept is pretty easy, the way they happen on a spectrum is weird. And it's a great example of how limited hardware creates unique solutions to problems. And DMA, which was a popular way, and still is, to save the CPU effort when working with large blocks of data. There's chapter markers, so feel free to jump around in the video a bit to find a specific topic you're interested in. And with that in mind, let's begin with memory and how it works on 8-bit systems. An 8-bit CPU is called that because it only has 8-bit wide registers and a 16-bit wide address bus. This means it can access 65,536 unique memory locations, each one being 8 bits wide. That gives us a total of 64K of addressable memory. The Spectrum 128, plus 2 and plus 3 came with 128K. The next comes with one mega standard, but you can have two if you put extra RAM chips on the board. Clearly this is bigger than the 64K of address space the CPU can access, so how does this work? For this to make sense, we need a bit of a history lesson. So sit tight while I wind the clock back to the late 70s and to a chip made by Intel, the 8080. The Spectrum is based off a Z80 CPU, which was made by Zilog a cheap and popular CPU that's still made today. It was based off a set of improvements to the Intel 8080 CPU, which would later turn into the 8086 and a whole architecture we still use today. The CPU in the next is an improvement over the Z80 and it's known as a Z80N CPU. It's got extra next-based opcodes and it can run at 28 megahertz. Underneath, it's still the same 8-bit Zilog Z80 that can only address 64K of RAM though. No matter how fancy your opcodes or how much RAM you have, if you're an 8-bit CPU, you've got to follow the rules of being an 8-bit CPU. The main one being addressing limits. Why did these limits exist though? Let's find out. Back in the 70s and early 80s, 64K of RAM was massive. Nothing came with that much. That'd be like a PC of today coming with a petabyte of RAM. Not only would that be excessive, but the hardware can't even support it. Even the mainframes of the day had at most 4 or 8 megabytes of RAM. Integrated circuits were expensive in the 80s, and they were hard to manufacture. The more of them you used, the more expensive the hardware was. So, for a cheap home computer, 64K sounded like plenty. In fact, it sounded like too much. The original Spectrum came with 16K. To make a functional machine though, certain pieces of memory needs attaching to the address space in a specific location. Due to how it's designed, the Z80 attempts to execute instructions starting from memory location zero. So traditionally, the first 16K of address space has a ROM chip stuck to it, leaving 48K of free RAM. Memory chips used to come in eight and 16K capacities back then. 8K wasn't quite enough, but 16 was a nice compromise. This is why we call the next predecessor a 48K Spectrum, if you didn't know. It's got 48K of free RAM. And since we're here, the 128K spec is called that because, well, it's got 128K of RAM. So let's leave the 70s behind and move boldly into the 80s. When RAM became cheaper, everything was made from black plastic and everyone's favorite uncle sold his company to some guy off The Apprentice. The original 48K Spectrum has a hardwired fixed memory layout. Here's my Spectrum Plus, same machine, different case. If we take the lid off it, you sit there, you can see there's not many chips inside it. There's 16K of ROM 
is directly attached to the CPU up under this heatsink. Then there's another 16K and these 4116 16K by one bit chips. That's the display memory. Then there's another 32K here in these eight chips. The machine was fixed in what it could do. There's no way to add more RAM. 64K, including the ROM, it's all you got. Or so we thought. Remember, this is the 80s. Bigger is better. Got bigger cars, bigger phones, size of this thing. We also had bigger computers. Computers with bigger heat sinks. Because along came the 128K Spectrum, which has a cool add-on down the side to store your morning toast. It also had some more RAM, which was kind of nice. Then we got bigger um, cases. It's my Spectrum Plus 3. It's massive. It's got more plastic than computer. There's also more storage options. And it's got the same 128K from the Toast Rack Spectrum. But if you remember basic maths, 128K doesn't go into 64 in all one go. So a way of working with the extra RAM is needed. It turns out, if you wire up the address lines and chip enable lines with some logic, it's possible to choose which parts of RAM appear in the system's address space. This is what memory banking is. A way to detach an area of RAM from the CPU, select a different section and map that instead, while the machine is running without crashing it. So you could have 128K of RAM in the machine, but only look at specific chunks of it at a time. Sinclair chose 16K chunks mapped into the top 16K of RAM. Using my Plus 3 as an example, you can see the RAM chips. Okay, There's four of them, and they're 1464 DRAM chips. Okay, They hold 64K of RAM, but only as four bits. So to make 64, you need a pair of them. And there's four in this machine, which makes up 128K. That's actually quite convenient and probably entirely on purpose. There's also a custom chip on the board that's kind of poking out this hole. That is an improvement of the famous ULA chip from the Speccy. And if you look at the schematic, which should be on the screen at the moment, you can see the system ROMs and two of the RAM chips are directly attached to the CPU. The other two RAM chips are not. They go through the gate array. The gate array works as a way to select which part of the two chips is attached to the CPU. And to do this, the programmer would write code to tell the gate array which bank of memory is to be mapped in. Sinclair chose 16K banks of memory and set the top 16K of address space to be reassignable. It's like having a 16K window at the top of memory and you can slide it around the extra 32K of RAM that the machine has got. It's quite interesting being able to see the reasons for design decisions by looking inside the hardware, innit? But we're not off down the rabbit hole of the Spectrum ULA today. So let's continue. So that's how the original Spectrum handled a whopping 128K of RAM. So what about the next? Said so it comes with one megabyte as a minimum. Do we have to look at that with the same 16K banking system? Well, yes, the original memory banking still works. The machine will happily let you manipulate RAM in 16K chunks as well. This is a Spectrum. Part of its Spectrumness is how the extended memory is accessed, so the 16K system still exists. I've got my next here. Uh, it's in this fetching reproduction case, bright green and orange. Deliberately made it to call a clash like the Spectrum. If I take out its PCB, you can see the RAM chips just here, and then there's two sockets that are where you would put extra chips to upgrade it to two meg. And there's the FPGA. The FPGA, by the way, is the great ancestor, or whichever way around it works, to the gate array that's inside a Spectrum Plus 3. So if we look at RAM in 16K chunks, a 1 meg next has 48 of them, which, you know, it's a nice coincidence. 48K Spectrums and all. However, on the next, RAM can also be split into 8K chunks, giving us 96 8K slots to play with. On the original Spectrum, you can only bank memory in and out of the top 16K of RAM at location C1000. It was hardwired to do this. On the next, using either assembly or C, you can bank 8K chunks anywhere in the CPU's address space, even banking out the ROM. And this is where things get even more fun, 
for varying definitions of fun. The ROMs in the next are obviously read-only. Trying to write to those locations makes no sense. Except you can bank in the Layer 2 display ROM into the same area as the system ROMs. And that means you can still read the ROMs, but trying to write to them, instead it goes to the screen. It's like the two things overlap each other in a memory. I've got a video on it, it's linked above. In my more detailed memory banking video, which is coming soon, you'll see how powerful this is. So that's how old machines with small CPUs manage to access large amounts of RAM. Let's look at another fundamental part of a machine's operation, interrupts, and how you can make a CPU stop what it's doing when a more important task comes along. Interrupts are a way to fake the machine running more than one piece of code at once. They're a way to give the CPU a poke and to say, hey, stop that, do this instead, do it now. Remember that awful mess of trying to configure sound cards in DOS and needing to specify an IRQ? Well, that's you telling the system to match up a specific interrupt with a specific device like your sound card. On an 8-bit system, they're usually limited to hardware devices wanting attention, and that's usually what you use them for. If you take your favourite 8-bit CPU, mine is obviously the Z80. You'll see it even has an interrupt pin. If you poke the CPU through that pin, it'll immediately stop what it's doing, stash some important bits away, and then bugger off and run something else called an interrupt handler. On the Spectrum, due to quite extreme but ingenious cost-saving decisions, you get one interrupt, and that happens at vertical blank. That's it. If you go and read up on Z80 interrupts, there's three types. There's IM0, IM1, and IM2. On the Spectrum, we use IM2, but not properly. There's also IM1, but that's only useful if you want to call ROM routines. To fully understand how these machines work, and why they work the way they do, we need to get in the mindset of a 1980s hardware engineer. In the early days of computing, tech was very expensive, so the aim was to use as little as possible while still having a functional computer. I mean, some companies like TI took this a bit too far and produced barely functional computers. The Sinclair ZX80 and ZX81 were about as cost reduced as a home computer could get. Seems a bit weird today, but computers of the day were still slightly seen as kids' toys rather than essential parts of society. We did not, in fact, buy Spectrums to do our homework. We used it to play Jet Set F***ing Willy, and Mrs Smith using her C64 to manage the local news agents was an exception rather than the rule. On the whole, making a Z80 based computer doesn't take much hardware. I built my own from kit and it uses about 6 ICs. And you know, obviously there's a video on that too, go click it up here. But back to Uncle Clive's machine, in order to get Jet Set Willy onto the machine, we need more than a CPU, we need peripherals, and a way to tell when those peripherals want attention. You see, the idea of an interrupt was that your computer could have external devices, messy things like printers and disk drives and display hardware. These were self-contained devices that sometimes, like the case of C64, they were self-contained computers in their own right. That means they don't sit around idle waiting for the host computer. They're not under its direct control. Instead, they're given instructions and told to go off and do their thing to report back when it's complete. The TV screen will redraw itself 50 times a second whether the computer is ready or not. A spinning disk is going to send data whether the previous data has been processed or not. And the tuneful melodies from a spectrum loading tapes, it's going to come off that tape at a specific board rate and the CPU better be ready for the data as it arrives. It's got no choice. Now, on the Z80 machines, the general idea was that devices triggering interrupts could put some data on the bus to tell the CPU what device was causing the interrupt. Then there's no need for lots of IRQ pins on the CPU package. The Z80 would then be set up with an interrupt vector table, which is just an area of memory containing the address of functions to run when interrupts happen. And the data on the bus would be combined with the start of this table to tell the CPU where to jump to in RAM to find the interrupt handler. I don't know, maybe the idea was to make a keyboard and decide, right up when the user presses a key, the keyboard can trigger an interrupt. When doing this, it's going to put hex 42 on the bus. And then your machine's operating system, you set up an interrupt table such that entry 42 hex contains the address of the keyboard handler. 
I guess it'd work, but I can also see why it wasn't used. You'd need some logic in the device to set the data on the bus and actually send the real data when the interrupt has been handled. And all of that requires more hardware and then your very cheap home computer becomes expensive. It also requires some kind of standard for keyboards and things, and that didn't exist. Sure, it's a clever system, and there's no need for any code to evaluate and work out what piece of hardware is causing the interrupt. A keyboard, for example, could just put 8 bits on the bus, trigger an interrupt, and the CPU works it all out by itself in hardware. But the setup for interrupts on a Spectrum is weird, and that gets a video all by itself. However, here's a quick rundown. On a Spectrum, things were a bit different from the Z80 specification for interrupt handling. There weren't different interrupts for each device. Sinclair went, nah, bugger that, we'll just do a vague blank interrupt, that's all you're going to get. Well, they probably didn't, you know. They probably agonised for hours trying to build a cheap computer that still functioned well enough to actually be usable. Because making hardware is very hard. Making cheap but functional hardware is an art. There's a reason why the Spectrum became so popular. It was cheap, but it still worked. So what they did was they designed a more creative system. It involves shoving 257, not 256, bytes of what I'm going to call structured garbage into RAM at a specific memory boundary, and then telling the POS Z80, yeah, that's your interrupt vector. Have fun. Since when an interrupt occurs on the Spectrum, the bus contains whatever random crap it had on it at the time. Devices don't actually put anything on there like they're supposed to. So the Z80 still tries to work out where to jump to in RAM by looking on its vector table using the value it finds on the bus. Which means the table needs filling with data that will trick it into going somewhere useful no matter what part of the table it ends up looking at. We then have to write our own code in a general interrupt handler to figure out what caused the interrupt and to deal with it. This kind of undoes the neat interrupt handling built into the hardware, but that's exactly the kind of excitement we can discover when talking directly to the metal. Often, as a programmer, you've got to overcome the challenges presented by the hardware. And having a V-Bank interrupt as the only interrupt in the system is one of them. So that's enough of the past. Let's jump over the 90s and the 2000s while the world figures out retro is cool again. And let's come back to the present day. The next is a successor to the Spectrum Plus 3 in a way. It's the next original Sinclair branded Spectrum after the Plus 3. And it inherits a lot of its functionality. It's just been extended, improved, and definitely done in a more programmer friendly manner. Let's look at one of those extras, the DMA controller. Apart from being the name of the company that made Lemmings and GTA, DMA also stands for Direct Memory Access, and it's a way of letting hardware communicate with RAM without the CPU being involved. To me this always sounded a bit weird. The CPU is in charge of the machine. It decides what happens. If there's no CPU, you've got no computer. Except the DMA controller can halt the CPU temporarily, mess around with RAM, and then let the CPU continue as if nothing had happened. It's like a coprocessor, but it doesn't do any processing as such. It's a state machine that you load with commands, and it runs off to complete them as fast as possible. Then it tells you when they're done. Sometimes it does that using an interrupt. Meanwhile, the CPU can go off and do its own thing. The DMA controller is specifically designed to quickly and efficiently copy blocks of RAM from one location to another, far faster than the CPU ever could. There did exist a DMA controller for the Z80 based machines, but they weren't ever put into any of the spectrums. I did some random googling, and it reveals that there are modern day add-on boards that contain them. But that's about it, it was never a mainstream device. The DMA can write to either RAM or I.O. ports, or both. And in the next, it runs at the full 28 MHz, not the speed the CPU is running at. This, along with the copper, is a reason why the next can do things that only usually exist on a 16-bit machine. The Layer 2 screen is 48k in size. Making the CPU copy 48k of data by itself is slow, even if you use an efficient copy loop done in pure assembly. There's only so many clock cycles, and reading them right in memory through the CPU eats those cycles up. The DMA controller can be configured with a source and a destination address, 
how much data to copy, and then just be told, well, sod off and do it then. And that's it. I mostly use the DMA to copy layer two images to the screen. It takes barely any effort from either me or the machine. In fact, the DMA can dump 48K of screen data on the display quicker than my own font printing routine can copy 11 lots of 16 pixel sprites to spell out hello world on the screen. Guess what? There's gonna be a video on the DMA coming soon as well. It's like I've planned all these in one go. While this isn't as detailed as other videos I've done, I hope this has been a useful introduction to several computing areas that often get overlooked. You know, modern computing is now so far removed from the hardware, this doesn't get mentioned much outside microcontrollers or people trying to write operating systems. Also, what I personally find interesting when researching this is spotting deliberate design decisions. In the 80s, I was a kid and largely incapable of making any sense of the hardware or assembly. I just bashed out basic listings and that was about it. And half the time they didn't work, so I just gave up. But the more I dig around in the innards of old machines now, and their modern recreations, the more I can see where someone or some engineer had an idea and then created a clever solution to some sort of problem they're encountering. Whether it's Sinclair making a cheap but functional machine, like a Spectrum, from as few parts as possible, or the Spectrum Next developers making it so the DMA controller and the copper can work together, triggered by an interrupt, so they can copy data from bank RAM to the screen to make cool Amiga style effects. You know, that stuff's quite impressive. Another thing missing from modern machines is that machines based off 8-bit systems are understandable by one person. I've got PC down there. I've got no hope of understanding how that thing actually works. I just know how to write code for it. So it's intensely satisfying being able to figure out not just how to make something work, but then to fully understand why it works. You know, it's nice knowing how to make the DMA do something. It's fun to see it working, but it's a whole new experience being able to understand the system so deeply you can follow the schematics and realize why you have to write code in a certain way. Quite like matching the schematics to why my code behaves. So I hope you'll join me next time when we do get lost down the rabbit hole of how the next RAM actually works using C code like normal. 64K isn't enough for everyone, so we need more. This is scene nine, there's no point stopping it. Ow! a bit me. Jeez.